Good morning. Great to be here this morning. As I told somebody, it's always nice to be asked back someplace that you've been. Uh, when you do what I do for our association, uh, most of the time it's a one-shot deal. You just get one, so you just got to unload everything you got and, and uh, give it. You know, you're talking about electronics, Matt, and here I am with an iPad, you know. Um, I can remember back years ago in a church I pastored, I, I had a legal, a yellow legal pad, and I had written all my notes for the sermon on that. And I took it up there, and one of my deacons came to me afterwards and said, Pastor, you just need to count on the Lord, not on yellow pages. So I don't know, you know, God speaks to you in, in all kinds of different ways. Uh, greetings from Dr. David Smith. Uh, he is in Romania today. Uh, his picture's in the paper today. And I texted him this morning and said, Your picture's in the paper. And he said, Save me a copy. He's just like the rest of us. Um, <laughs> but, but he's over there teaching at the seminary and has his daughter with him. And she's doing a uh, uh, study thing, a leading uh, a study thing for, for, for her Baylor uh, degree. And uh, so pray for them this week as they're there in, in Romania. Uh, I want to talk to you about a commandment for the 11th hour. A former President Ronald Reagan uh, told a story in the latter part of his presidency about Alexander Dumas. Uh, it seems that Dumas and, and one of his really good close friends got into a, a disagreement. And it just, it just ballooned, just ballooned and got bigger and bigger. And finally they decided that the only way that they could solve this dilemma was to have a duel. But then they realized that they were both excellent shots. And so they decided that if they had a duel, they probably both would die. And so they decided to draw straws. And the one who got the short straw would shoot himself. And Alexander Dumas got the short straw. And so his friends gathered with him in front of the presidential library and he went inside, and pretty soon there was a single shot. And they all rushed in to see what had happened, and there stood Alexander Dumas with a smoking gun in his hand. And he said, I missed. <laughs> I wonder sometimes, as Christians people who know the Lord Jesus Christ as the Lord and the Savior of their life and have made the commitment of their life, if sometimes we don't miss the real essence of what the gospel is all about. We love the Ten Commandments, and the Ten Commandments are as relative today as they were the day that Moses marched, marched down the mountain with those tablets of stone. There are lots of thou shalt nots. And the Ten Commandments are absolutely. And we should not have other gods before him. No matter what those gods are. Whether they're people or TV or money or whatever. And we should not curse God. In fact we should not curse anybody. And cursing should not be in our language repertory. We should not forget to remember the Sabbath and worship regularly. We should not dishonor our parents. Honoring them will give us longer and healthier lives. We shall not murder. Murder is not a part of God's design. We should not commit adultery. In any form, whether it's sexual activity outside of marriage, whether it's heterosexual or homosexual, is against God's design. We should not take what belongs to others, that's stealing, and we should not covet. 
But these are stated in a negative way, but they are positives for life. They are positives for living. But then, let us not forget what Jesus said in John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. He says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another even as I have loved you. And you also love one another. By this all men shall know that you are my disciples if you love one another. So before I spell out some things, let me just get you to think with me about a couple of reflections. It's interesting to me that this is just before Jesus died. And through some things that have happened in my own life and lately and in my Bible study lately, I've just come to a new awareness of how cruel that death was on the cross that he died for me. For me. And yet, one of the last things that he says is that we should love one another. Why did he wait so late in his ministry? It, it, it's not the first time that we're told to love in the Bible. We'll talk about that in a minute. But I, I think the answer is his disciples. I think that he wanted his disciples in view of what was going to happen. He wanted them to have that in their mind. Because sometimes the last thing that we hear someone say is what we remember. The second thing that I, I remember that his disciples and his followers were to transfer this love to one another and to others. But you know, the disciples were human. There, there was jealousy among them. Who's going to sit on the right hand? Who's going to sit on the left hand? Me, I just want to be there. And, and thirdly, why in this last hour? You know, the, the nature of God is love. That's God's nature. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have life everlasting. Love is what God is all about. The gift that he gave in his son. Love is God's ongoing activity. Have you been blessed by God's love lately? I was blessed by, by what Matt did a while ago. Really blessed, Matt. God blesses us. So, then here are some things. First of all, Christ's greatest desire from us is to love one another. If you want to know what Jesus wants from us the most, from those who trust him, he wants from us the most that we love one another. There are lots of things that we may do. There's lots of things that we should do. We may tithe and we should. We may teach and we should if that's our gift. We may sing in the choir and we should if that's our gift. There are many things that we may do, but, but listen to me carefully this morning. If we do all of the things that we may do and all of the things that we should do and we don't love one another, and that one another expands far beyond this congregation, far beyond this city, far beyond this country, it means the world. If we don't love others and care about them, I think that we've missed the gospel message. Jesus' commandment was not a new commandment. Deuteronomy 6, 5, we are told to love God. Leviticus 19, 18, we are told that we are to love our neighbors as ourselves. But this love that Jesus talked about was a love that he modeled. He modeled in his sacrifice. It is produced through the new covenant. By the transforming power of the Holy Spirit. 
You see, I firmly believe that we come to that point that we want to receive Jesus Christ into our lives and we receive him into our life that the Holy Spirit comes in us and lives in us and lives through us and we may wrestle with life and we may get out of sorts and we may even get out of sorts with God but that spirit's still there I'm of the old school once saved always saved if you meant it if you did it it's going to be there, it's there, and it'll come back to you. This love was to be a badge of discipleship. And we have to remember that, that we will not always agree as Christians, but we can disagree in love. It was, a new, it was new because before... Never before, never before had love been a badge that men would be known by. Think of all that love between friends and what love between people, what love in a marriage, what love in a family, what love outside of a family means. What it entails. Think about what Jesus said, as I have loved you. And think about what it means. The love of Jesus is the love of, of a spiritual being. It gives us a hunger to know more about his word. It gives us a hunger to be with God's people. Years that I pastored a church, I often wondered if I didn't, if I wasn't a pastor, would I get up on Sunday morning and go to worship, go to Bible study? Well, I have. I guess I have the answer. Because I love being with God's people. I love the fellowship of the Lord. It's a spiritual thing. It's a spiritual life. He says, I came that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. It's a spiritual fellowship with God and with like-minded people. The new commandment is the mark of a true disciple. I love peanuts. You know, Charlie Schultz has been gone a long time, and those peanuts, they keep coming back. And every day, I read the funnies every day. I love the funnies. My granddaughter thinks that's funny, that I love the funnies. But, but anyway, and peanuts and and. Charlie Brown is telling Lucy that she needs to be more loving. And you know, Lucy, she's got her arms folded. She's got that determined look on her face. And finally, she whips around, and she whips around so fast that Charlie does a backward somersault, and she says, look, blockhead, the world I love, it's people I just can't get along with. Now, sometimes I think I represent that remark. But anyway, when we examine the text carefully, what Jesus said is, as I have loved you, as I love you also, love one another. Also have love for one another. Think for a moment about the meaning of that. You remember what Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 13? My, my Bible study group, we, we're in First and Second Corinthians, so we went through First Corinthians 13 just a while back. Paul lists 15 things in First Corinthians 13 about love. He said, love is patient. My wife would tell you that I'm short on that. Love is kindness. Love is not having envy. Love is not boastful. Love is not arrogant. Love is not rude. Love is not seeking self. Love is not irritable. Love is not keeping a record of wrongs. Love is no joy in unrighteousness. Love is rejoicing in the truth, believing all things, 
bearing all things, hoping all things, enduring all things. Wow. Comedian Jerry Clower in one of his books tells a story about being in a restaurant. And were two Christian businessmen seated at a table and the waitress came out and she had a, a tray with a bowl of soup on it and she dumped the bowl of hot soup in the lap of one of these Christian businessmen. And everybody in this small restaurant just, you know, they look, what's going to happen? Is the manager going to come out and fire her? Is the businessman going to jump up and scold her? And the businessman got up and said, young lady, I am so sorry that this has happened to you. But stuff just happens. How would you have reacted in that situation? How would you handle a situation like that? Could you love as the master would have us love? I just went through an ordeal with my car. My car was in the shop at the dealership for 40 days and 40 nights. <laughs> I, that, that's the honest truth. <laughs> it's just one thing after another. You know, I had a cylinder head misfire, and that cylinder was recalled, and so they were going to replace it. Fortunately, I bought, a, I bought a lifetime warranty on this car. And uh, uh, then when they took the head off, the bolt stripped out of the block. So they had to order a new engine. And when the engine came, it was damaged. So they had to get another new engine. I'm driving it today. Uh, thank you. But how was I going to react? And I think the, the guy that was managing it was kind of waiting for me to unload on him. But hey, it wasn't his fault. It wasn't the mechanic's fault. It wasn't anybody's fault. It was just stuff happens. And we have to keep our focus on what God wants us to do. The second thing is the source of love is Christ. He is the source of our love. The 11th commandment to love is not merely another commandment. Rather, it is a natural response to the love we receive from him. His love is unconditional. When the love of Jesus dwells in the heart of a believer, several things happen. The believer has to love, has a love that causes him to do several things. It binds his life to the lives of those around him. It ties his life to the same purpose as other believers. It surrenders his will to be the same mind as the other believers. The, the sound man back there, I don't remember his name, but having a conversation about his school, I don't want to embarrass him, having a conversation about his school, he said, I don't know what God has for me. Amen, brother? It's a way to live your life. Find out what God has for you in your life. I never envisioned doing what I'm doing, by the way, in retirement. To understand and feel with believers. To forgive other believers always. That's a hard one sometimes. That's a hard one sometimes. I, I had some tough times as a pastor with some folks in my congregation. But I'm not going there. <laughs> Sacrifice. Sacrifice ourselves for other believers. A little boy on TV the other night, and they were doing the training, shooter, active shooter training in school. This kid's that high. They interviewed him, they interviewed his mother. He told them that he wanted to be in the front because if anybody was going to get shot, he wanted to save the other people in his class from being shot. And his mother said to him, honey, your mother doesn't want you to do that. And he said, I know, Mom. So she said, you won't do that, right? And she said, he said, no, Mom, I have to do what I have to do. We got to do what we got to do. 
the welfare of others. To completely deny self. We frequently, frequently sing a song. Just as I am without one plea. But that thy blood was shed for me. And if I understand that we are loved. Just as we are with no strings. That love though transforms our lives. Tom Chambers was a professional basketball player. <clears throat> Excuse me. And, but he had a sour look on his face all the time. People just remarked, Tom, with, with everything you have and all that life has given you, and you just always look like you're about to be angry. And he said, well, I, I grew up tough. I grew up in a home where my father didn't appreciate me. Nothing I did, no matter how good a game I played, no matter whether we won or not, it didn't make any difference. He always had something critical to say. And so he said, I guess I painted that mask on my face, and I've worn it ever since. The author of the article in Sports Illustrated concluded... Perhaps that is the reason Tom etched a scowl on his face early on in his career and has kept it there. Two terrible things about that. One is that there was so little unconditional love available to him as a child. And worse is the fact that he looked for that unconditional love in the wrong places. Unconditional love is not found in family or fans. It's found in Jesus. The third thing I would say to you is our love for one another is the primary witness for God in this world. Primary witness for God in this world. By this all men shall know that you are my disciples if, 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 you love one another. Educator Jeffrey Holland tells a story about a preschool teacher who was facing burnout. She, she'd come to the place where she loved kids, but she'd come to the place where she didn't know whether it was her problem or whether kids just weren't like they used to be and families weren't just like they used to be and she was just about to, to give it all up and her mother died. She was very close to her mother, so it was a traumatic experience for her. She went through that, and she needed to take some time off, so she took a week away, and she shopped, and she puttered in the garden, and she watched TV, and then she decided <clears throat> that she had to go back to work. And so the first day was pretty much as she had thought it would be. You know, she went through the day, and she smiled at the children and, and everything, and she got a little break in the afternoon, and she was coming back from the break, and she came around the corner, and little Rachel was there in the hall, and she had picked the last flower from the pot of flowers in the hall. And she said, Rachel, what are you doing? And, and Rachel said, Miss... Carol, would this flower help you be like a mother again? I, I know you've been fussed in your mind, but will it help you be like a mother again? And Miss Terrell thought, a five-year-old can see? She said, well, what, what Rachel, well, she said, my, my mother passed away and, and little Rachel said you mean she died and she said yes she died she said well did she live until she died and Miss Terrell said yes Rachel everybody lives until they die she said oh no Miss Terrell everybody doesn't live until they die some people die and they just keep walking around don't let your mother's death allow you to die 
and keep on walking around. Wow. Out of the mouths of babes. How do we witness to the world that Christ is alive? I have, I have a hard time with unhappy Christians. I've seen people go through everything you can think of as Christians and still keep a smile on their face. I had a dear friend and she came down with cancer and she decided that she was not going to go through the treatment. She was going to let it take its course. And I went to the hospital to visit her and I know her children wanted me to talk her out of it. But she smiled at me and she said, Pastor, it's time for me to go be with Jesus with a smile on her face. It was a popular movie a few years ago called The Color Purple. Some of you may have seen it. It's probably on Netflix or Amazon or one of those. But anyway, Sophie experienced some kindness in a dark and troubled time in her life that so deeply affected her. And looking back over that kindness, she said, it was then that I knew that there was a God. Intuitively, she knew that someone's kindness was the best evidence that there was a God. But this, by this, all men shall know that you are my disciples, that you love one another. How poor, important is love, you ask? It's what Christ died for. It's why he died, because he loved us. He loved us, and the purpose for his death is love, that we continue to love those around us, that they may also come to Jesus. Are we like Alexander Dumas and miss at close range? Because if we're Christians, we're close to being what God wants us to be. But we have to understand that that means that we are to love all of those around us. Let's pray together. Father God, thank you for the opportunity to be here this morning. And thank you for the opportunity to worship with these friends in this church. And I pray, Father, that as we conclude our time of worship together, that we would look in our hearts and we would see, first of all, to know for sure that we've come to that place in life where we've invited Jesus in and that he is our Lord and he is the Savior of our lives. And then, Father, as we recognize that, that we recognize the fact that it is our commandment from him, directly from him, that we love others and love those around us that they may also find that salvation and that relationship with you. Father, I pray as we have an invitation this morning, that there's someone here that's never trusted Jesus, that they'll just come down and talk to Pastor Chris and get that straightened out. Perhaps there are some here that you've guided to be a part of this fellowship. Whatever the need might be this morning, Father, just pray that your will be done. Matt's going to lead us as we sing, as we stand together. Would you come? For those who want to come and pray for this interim process you need to speak to Chris he's here but if you just want to come and pray come to the altar and pray during this time